Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. On tonight's program, I go after a really important point. What's going to happen to interest rates in the USA? Another important point, what's going to happen to interest rates in Australia? And finally, a third and very important point, what's going to happen to the Aussie dollar? If you're investing overseas, you want to know what's going on with the Aussie dollar. I do that with Michael uh, Knox, who's the Chief Economist at Morgan's, the, the stockbroking firm. Then Paul Rickard and I look at November, what's in store for people playing the stock market. And then Arjun Pullawal from investorkit.com.au looks at all the, the stuff that's been around for first home buyers and others like investors coming out of the budget and even things before the budget have a big impact possibly on who's buying and what it might do to home prices as well. That's coming up later in the show. But before we start, I want to focus on what we've been seeing recently. And that is, there's a lot of positivity in the stock market. Now, it has been curtailed by the fact that Jerome Powell overnight started talking about US interest rates not necessarily coming off the boil or dissipating in their increases in the near future. That's what the market expected to hear today. Didn't hear it, and that's why the stock market is down today. On Friday, we, we get the um, US uh, job number. That also could either excite the stock market or scare the stock market, depending on the inflation implications. And then on November 10, next week, the inflation number comes out. If it's a good one, the stock market will go up. If it's a bad one, it'll go down. And these are the important issues that are driving markets. But how do you play this interesting situation? Well, the feeling is that interest rates are going to eventually stop rising. And that's when the US dollar will fall and the US dollar will go up. So if you're investing overseas, you have to ask yourself the question, do I need to actually be in a hedged product? Now, as I mentioned a couple of weeks, a really good hedge product is IHVV for my shares. It gives you access to the US stock market, uh, the S&P 500, but you have a hedging in there, so if the Aussie dollar goes up, you won't lose the benefit of being in a market that I think will rebound pretty strongly in 2023 when interest rates stop rising. That's a really important point. The IHVV chart shows you that um, it can really do very well, and particularly when the Aus dollar is rising and the US market's going up, which I think will happen in 2023, it does really, really well. That's a pretty, um, a pretty easy play to play. Another one is just simply buying the Australian stock market. It will follow the US, um, US S&P 500, um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see in 2023 uh, as interest rates start to come down and inflation falls as well, or even if interest rates stay where they are and the inflation comes down, I wouldn't be surprised to see a 10% rise in the ASX 200 index, plus dividends of about four, franking credits of two, with about 16% return, buying the best 200 companies in Australia. So that's not, not a bad play, it's a pretty safe kind of play. But if you really want something big and aggressive, which might be an interesting play, have a look at something from beta shares with the ticker code HNDQ. Now what this does is it gives you the top 100 companies in the NASDAQ, and of course, which is primarily seen as a tech heavy index. But there are a lot of other companies in the top 100, companies like Starbucks and Costco, uh, other well-known companies are in that top 100. And a lot of these companies have been smashed over the last year, and eventually they will rebound. And when they rebound, it could be a really big rebound. But HNDQ is also hedged. So you actually get the, the insurance of uh, if the Aussie dollar rises as US stock market rises, it actually offsets any losses that could happen from a rising dollar. I'll take you back to early 2000s um, after the Nasdaq really smashed. I actually went out and w took a, an ETF called the Triple Q and uh, put it in my super fund. It was shooting the lights out as the Nasdaq re rebounded, but the Aussie dollar rose at the same time. I learned the lesson 
And now when I play the US market, when the Aussie dollar is low, I hedge. This HNDQ, I've got it up on screen right now. Have a look at that. You can see it did really well until this year, and that's when it came off the boil because the US market's gone off the boil, and also the Aussie dollar has fallen. Eventually, I suspect that's going to turn around. I think we'll see it in 2023. And my interview with Michael Knox gives you an idea of when the Aus dollar might start to rebound and the US dollar should fall. I thought it happened earlier uh, in 2023. Knox's got it a bit later, but the bottom line is if you're investing for a year out, um, getting in on uh, a pretty interesting product, risky, don't think it's a safe product, but you are investing in some of the best companies in the world in the NASDAQ. It's just you have to wait for um, the stock market to forgive those tech companies that are right in the, um, the uh, NASDAQ 100. But it's a really, really interesting play. Um, I'll, I'll put on the screen the companies, the big um, companies are in that top 100 and that might make you even more enthusiastic about the prospects of this, as I say, risky investment. Good luck with your investing over, over the, the future. And remember, when you invest overseas and the Aussie dollar is low, it's good to have a bit of hedging. Well, two of the most important things investors have to think about right now is what's going to happen to interest rates and particularly if you're going to invest overseas, what's going to happen to the Aussie dollar? And the guy who I like to talk to, particularly when it comes to the dollar, is Michael Knox, Chief Economist at Morgan's in Brisbane. Mate, great to see you. It's good to see you, Peter. And okay. good to see that you're in such good health. Yeah, I know. Very, very cynical of you to say that, given the fact you know I'll go cold. Now, tell me this, Michael. Um, let's start with the easy bit first, which is not easy. Interest rates. Um, Jerome Powell spoke last night, and you're a close US watcher, um, and you're a buddy buddy of Dr. Phil Lowe, PhD Dr. Phil, as you always remind me. Um, so tell us what you think is going to happen to interest rates over from now into 2023. Well, it was very simple until uh, uh, this morning, um, Peter, because uh, I and everybody else had worked out that on the uh, summary of economic projections that were at the last Fed meeting, that uh, uh, this was like going to be the last 75 basis point rate hike. And after this, there was going to be a 50 basis point rate hike. And after that, there was going to be 75 basis points. And rates would actually peak in February at 4.6%. And here we have um, uh, Jay Powell uh, come out this morning and blow up that whole scenario. Mm. And say uh, and tell us that, uh, um, given what's been happening to inflation since the last meeting, they now think uh, that rates will go higher than that. So now the um, and as a result of that, um, because the market, like I, uh, thought that rates would be increasing at a slower rate uh, from now on, um, uh, they sold off. And uh, now the best estimate is that uh, in December, uh, the Fed has a 75 basis point rate hike, taking it to 4.6%, and a 50 basis point rate hike on the 1st of February, taking it to 5.1%. And then we don't know what, what happens after that. Mm. Now, the scenario for Australian interest rates was based on us following uh, what the Fed was doing, but at only 25 basis points a month. And at that rate, we were going to get to the same rate as the assumed, the previously assumed peak uh, of the Fed at 4.6% uh, in July. And uh, there's no reason we have to go up as rapidly as the, the, um, as the Fed. Uh, I think uh, the um, RBA, uh, there's a num number of reasons why we don't have to. Their uh, inflation is really because of their budget stimulus was so good, so big, it peaked at 16% of GDP in 2020, whereas ours uh, was only 7% of GDP in mm. 2020. So mm. we don't have the same kind of structural reasons that we need 
to get to the same inflation level that they have or is that our inflation is as bad as theirs, uh, we should be able to get away with uh, following them more slowly. But we just don't know at the moment where we're following them to. Yeah. Uh, but it's a number over 5% uh -huh. that uh, the Fed will get to early yeah. next year. And, and we'll get to the same number in the middle of uh, next year. So you think you think our cash rate will go as high as what? 5.1. The Australian one? Uh, in the previous resources boom, our cash rate dropped to four and three quarter percent. Uh, but commodities in this cycle have been higher than that. But let's let's uh, let's see where we are in the middle of next year. Um, rates usually lead the economy by about four to five quarters. By the time we get to the middle of next year, we'll be able to see what the effect of what's already been happening has done to slow down the Australian economy. And it might be already enough. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's likely that we don't need to put up our rates perhaps as far as the US uh, this time and that gives uh, us an introduction for the second subject that you wanted to talk about uh, and name, the namely the dollar yeah so yes so let's start off with the the big picture first where do you think the Aussie dollar will be in a year's time well in terms of the previous models that we've, we've had that have worked up until this year, um, commodity prices have been extremely important, but right now, but that would suggest that the, um, uh, the Aussie dollar was about two standard errors higher than it is. The reason that uh, we're in this much lower level seems to be associated with the, what we might call the US dollar shortage, the rate of growth of international reserves in US dollars in the international monetary system has published um, uh, um, by the International Monetary Fund uh, every quarter. Seems to be growing at a, a, or seems to actually falling over the last year. And it's fallen at a rate by about 5.7%. It was falling in that same manner in uh, 2015. Um, and uh, that generated a very tight situation in international liquidity um, and uh, generated a strong US dollar at that time too, which brought down uh, many, many, many prices. And that seems to be where we are right now. So that the, uh, there's a short, yes, commodity prices should in a normal circumstance generate a lot of capital inflow in Australia and generate a higher level of the Australian dollar. But right now, there's a US dollar shortage in the international monetary system, and that's keeping the Aussie dollar and everything else, the euro, sterling, Singapore dollar, all of those currencies low relative to the US. Okay, so th there was a thought, Michael, that when the Americans have peaked on interest rates, that would be a time when the A dollar would probably start to rise and the US dollar would fall. Is that a, a is that a fair assumption? That's absolutely sensible. And uh, up until um, this morning, yeah. I thought that that was going to be February next year. And I thought that this whole process of tightening uh, by the Federal Reserve would be over uh, with the February meeting, which uh, I think is uh, the 1st of February, so the 2nd of February our time. Hmm. And that would be the end of the whole tightening cycle. But hmm. uh, um jay persists yeah and uh so there's so the right. it's like it's going to go further but we don't know yeah uh, exactly I, when. but I, I also remember the good old days when both you and i had a lot more hair um, um and you probably remember what reserve bank governor was big on this but i know when i learned economics and taught economics we didn't talk about jawboning until, was it the 80s or 90s, where reserve banks really got out there and did talking to make sure that their monetary policy worked the way they wanted it to work. Could you, Jerome, you, you can tell me what date you think it was, but Jerome Powell would also be jawboning after he scared a lot of Americans into spending less. Why should he come out and say, hey, I'm going to ease up with, just when you guys think I'm going to ease up? He'd better off keeping the, 
the pressure on, and if the inflation number surprises either in November or December, then it can then the market would presume is going to ease up, wouldn't they? Um, well, the the concern, the the view that uh, that I have is that our inflation is going to peak at the very end of this year at the level of a bit over eight percent, and then decline through uh, next year. Uh, I think that the uh, US will have a similar experience, but it may be it's our, their inflation will pick a higher level than us. I don't, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, but what should happen is that uh, inflation will peak at the end of this year and then begin to fall as we go through next year. What should, the, the result of that will be is that inflationary expectations will start to decline, particularly uh, for long-term assets like bonds. And bond yields will peak uh, and decline as we go through the year. Yeah. So um, now my understanding of what the Fed, uh, the approach that the Fed is going to take is that it will raise and hold wherever it gets to probably in the first quarter of next year it will just keep short rates where it is and long-term rates will then decline as inflation declines. And then the yield curve will probably invert in the US, mm. uh, threatening a recession if they keep short rates up for a longer period of time. Now, how tight they are depends on where inflation is. But, um, yeah. but I think that the, the good thing about that uh, outlook is that uh, stock markets really have a very low uh, statistical, statistical relationship with short rates. The very strong relationship that uh, stock markets have is with 10-year uh, bond yields. Mm. And I think as inflation falls as we go through next year and 10-year um, bond yields fall as we go through next year, that will generate uh, the beginning of the recovery in stock markets. But mm. we still have to get through this very tough first quarter where the Fed decides exactly where it's going to peak interest rates at. Okay. So just for those people who didn't understand a word you said, because you are a, a very intelligent man, very intelligent man, um, let's just guess, um, by the end of next year, would you think the Aussie dollar would be back into the 70 cent region? Um, yeah, I would... Yes, I would. Uh, I, I think it should be recovering. I think as the uh, U.S. bond yield. I think the other thing that's happening is that there's more of the excess stock, or, and it was something that Jay Powell referred to, but didn't provide detail on. Um, and that is uh, the rundown of the of the assets of the Federal Reserve. So what should happen is those assets come forward to be cleared in the market. Then, uh, you, then uh, the additional volume of bonds coming forward to be cleared in the market should force down the real exchange rate of the US dollar yeah. uh, as we go through the year. And as the US dollar falls, the real exchange rate falls, um, the Aussie dollar, well, firstly, uh, the euro <clears throat> would rise a bit, um, sterling and uh, the Singapore dollar, which are the, the banking currencies, should actually uh, provide a little bit of a leading a lead yeah. to other currencies, yeah. and as they go up, um, we we should see uh, a number of currencies follow, okay. including yeah. ours, uh, by the time we get to the middle of the year. Yeah. Last man in the street question for the man who doesn't live in the street. Imagine one of your wonderful children came to you and said, "Dad, uh, I want, I'm I'm going to play." the idea that the US stock market's going to rebound in 2023 sometime, all right? Do, yes. I, do, I hedge, do I hedge my investment or do I not hedge my investment? What are you going to say to, to your wonderful child who asked that question? Well, we're starting from a point where the, uh, the, the Fed has, has lifted to the terminal point and has decided to hold. At that point, um, uh, that's the point from which you expect uh, US bond yields to start to fall. And that's the point at which you expect the, the uh, 
other currencies start to rise. And from that point on, yes, I think it'd be pretty intelligent to uh, yeah. hedge your exposure to... Uh, yeah. So if you hedge dollars. now, you might be getting in too, too early, but you won't necessarily lose. You, you don't see the Aussie dollar falling much from here, do you? Uh, well, if, if we look at uh, where the Aussie dollar bottomed out last time, um, it bottomed out in the range uh, 59 to 62 cents. And this is when in 2020 when there was enormous amount of pressure on everything mm. else. Um, and that's uh, that's very close to where we are now. So uh, um, I think that's as, that's a, you know, the practical history of, mm. uh, okay. of, of where the bottom is uh, in recent years. Okay, so for, so for the sake of your child who might not understand what you're talking about, the basic answer is yes, you would hedge. Yes. <laughs> okay, mate. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. As always, very insightful. And today we want to focus on a really important topic, November. What's in store? Will the market go up or will the market go down? And I suspect Paul is going to tell us it's going to depend on data. Paul? Well, I think it is, Peter. A quick look back at October and also yep. the year to date, just to sort of set the scene. A good month in October locally, up 6%, but still down a year to date. Mm. So uh, seven, almost 8% on price terms. If you look at back dividends, about 4%. Interesting enough, Peter, still the, the top half of the market doing a lot better than mm. the bottom half. So, mm. in, for example, the, the large cap top 20 stocks, almost flat year to date when you add back dividends. Mm. Mid caps and smaller caps are still doing weaker, smaller caps down almost 20%. So it's been a very much, I guess, partly a defensive uh, interest, but the market is wanting to position it in the top stocks, the yeah. banks and the big and large And Paul, history has shown us that when there's been a big sell of the stock market, it's the reliable uh, type of company to get bought first because they've been sold off, but at least you can punt that they're going to do pretty well. Yeah, and I think people really look for, very, as I said, a bit more safety and, and uh, you know, some of the smaller caps, higher risk, smaller markets, less liquidity. Mm. You know, you get holding those, you get caught holding those, who knows what's happened. Mm. Actually, just to put our market in perspective compared to the US, uh, the US had a huge rally in, uh, in October, but very a scatty rally. So yeah. what went up was the Dow Jones. So the Dow Jones is only 30 stocks. 30 quality 30 stocks. 30 quality stocks, yeah. uh, up 14%. I think it was the best month since 1976. So yep. that's going back in history. The S&P 500, which is a much broader indicator, only up 8%. With that's lots of tech in it. Lots of tech, still down almost 19% year to date. So mm. that puts the Australian market's fall of only 4% in context. And the NASDAQ only rallied almost 4% and still down about 30% year to yeah. date. So tech unloved, a lot of the big name companies there uh, reported pretty negatively, mm. at least as far as the market's concerned. And uh, that sort of uh, led to what it was a fairly uneven rally, Peter. Yeah, okay. So let's go and look at the sectors, Paul. Yeah, in Australia, look at coming back to our market, really led by financials. And again, I guess that's partly safety, but also the impact of higher interest rates and a realisation that... Uh, yeah, margins are improving quite quickly. And maybe the whole scary stuff about bad debts, that's still the never-never, in yeah. my opinion. So financials up 12.2% uh, for the month. Uh, big rally and positive year-to-date up 2.7%. The other standout there is energy, Peter, and that's, of course, Ukraine. So that's your Woodside and your Santos's and yeah. oil searches up 9.5%, up 51.3%. So if you haven't been long energy or at least market weight, it's been hard to have a winning performance. And the third one I'd highlight there is real estate. Now, real estate's done a pretty tough all year. Really as you'd tough. As you'd expect from higher interest rates, but a bit of a, a rebound in October, up 9.3%, still down 21.3%. And so that's people chasing value, isn't it, Paul? They know eventually real estate would do well when interest rates stop rising and some of the smarties are getting in early. Yeah, it's a funny story in real estate, a lot, mainly it's property trusts. They, they took a while to react, which was quite surprising normally whenever interest rates are going up and mm. you know, they're the, one of the first sectors to be hit. But they did react pretty badly in you know, July, August uh, and June. But a bit of a rebound in September when the market said maybe we've taken it uh, a little bit too far. So quite varied performances across the sectors. IT obviously still down 32% year to date. So mm. a lot of companies there still really wallowing. Struggling. Yep. Okay, well, let's look ahead, Paul. It was, what's the big data drops we're looking for? Well, we'll talk about the data drop, but this market is still about three things. Inflation, 
interest rates right. and it, is a recession coming? You know, yeah. in the US, they're 100% convinced there's a recession. In Australia, may well, we've got the recent numbers in the budget, maybe we won't be. So they're the three things still driving the market. Yep. Until we get a really good read on each of those three things, and they're all they're obviously interlinked inflation yeah. and interest mm -hmm. rates and, 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 you know, we're probably not going to know, but uh, let's look at what's going on in the USA. So uh, employment data due out at the end of this week on the 4th of November. Mm. I guess the market wants to see higher unemployment. <laughs> yeah. They want bad news to be good news. They want bad news to be good news. Uh, Midterm elections uh, on Tuesday. Now, they're probably not going to cause any any uh, ruptures in the market, but you never know. You can't rule If the Republicans out. take, take um, for example, the, the Senate or the House, what's the more, most likely, Paul? Well, I think it's most likely they're going to win one Senate seat and they only need to win one. And so that basically gives them a, would give them a 51 to 49 majority in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, and that will hamstring Biden for the next two years. So, Which the market might like. The market sort of, yeah, the market doesn't mind that as much, particularly mm. when it's Republican in control. It means no crazy spending, right? Mm. And uh, so I don't think that's necessarily negative for the market. I think the market's probably going to ignore these, but you can never rule out yep. that uh, something... Uh, we don't expect happening in the market taking uh, umbrage or something. The big one's October CPI. That's our 10th of November. Yeah. Uh, we'll get another read of that in again in December. So that's what the market's watching. It wants to see uh, you're the core rate down, uh, and that's continuing to trend the down trend the headline down. number. Yep. And yep. Uh, so that's the market's going to be really on edge. And then finally, the US Fed it won't meet again to the 13th and 14th of December. Uh, and again, the question mark's still going to be over that. Is that another three quarters or just half a percent? Could the Fed be a little more nuanced yeah. uh, in the way it approaches interest rates uh, come that yeah. meeting in December? What, what is spoken about by Fed officials over that time can have a big impact on the market because the, the recent up uh, trend in the market has come from a lot of Fed officials saying, well, maybe we might, might be time for a pause or some, things like that. And the market's really lapped that up. Yeah. In Australia, not really a lot of data to look at the next month. The October CPI, I mean, we're now getting monthly CPI numbers. Yeah. They're only about 70% of the, of the real number. Mm. This probably going to get more traction simply because we're so worried mm. about inflation. Yes. The RBA has its final meeting on December the 6th, and then we get the day after uh, GDP out for the December for the September quarter. will yeah. give us a read on the economy. So not a lot of data locally to look at. We're going to be focused on the US. It sort of, you sort of get the sense the market's trying to rally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, look, I'm probably until we see the data that really confirms that inflation is coming yeah. down. Yeah. I'm sort of not convinced that we're going to see a sustainable breakthrough. And I guess just a little look at the trends. This is a summary of the uh, US S and P 500, both looking at the 30-day moving average and the 300-day uh, moving average. Uh, the 30-day in in, uh, in green and the 300-day in blue mm. and the US S&P 500 in black. We haven't really broken back through, so we're still in the trend is still down yeah. in price terms. And the COPOX, another indicator in green, Pete, yeah. that's still pretty negative. And so, so people looking at this, at this chart, the black line, which is the uh, S&P 500, it's broken through the 30-day average, right? But it ha if it gets through the blue line, it's beaten the 300-day moving average, and that's a really positive sign yeah. for the market to take off. And that might happen if if the, the inflation numbers in the US are good in November and December. But that's what they wait for. It's going to need a lot of a lot of good data. Yeah. And you think, although you know, maybe the market wants to rally into Christmas. Maybe it's already tried to do. Yeah. But look, I think we've got to be a little bit cautious. But this is still about inflation and interest rates and recession, and the market's going to toss and turn. Wants to see some data. Uh, before it believes that the worst is all yeah, over. That's a good assessment, Paul. Well, nowadays, governments are coming up with innovative schemes to try and improve the ownership of homes. And Arjun Palawal, the director at investorkit.com.au, has a few views on some really important issues. Arjun, thanks for joining us. Always great to be on, my friend. All right, mate, let's go for the first one. You want to talk about first home buyer shared equity schemes. Maybe you should explain to people exactly what it is in case they don't know and tell us what your views are about this. Firstly, the shared equity scheme is a, a scheme that the Labor government proposed as part of, I guess, the, the vote gathering process. And uh, it's essentially where the, instead of the government, say, backing you know, the securities like the first home buyer um, 
the the guarantor from the lending side of things they're actually being on the journey with you by being part owners of the property itself uh, so from a perspective of you know you being able to get in there with less money that's definitely helpful but the downside is that you know you're in the asset ownership space with the government so there might be that feeling for many of is it a bit too complicated is it a bit too complex uh, is there many factors to think about with co-ownership rather than you know you owning it in some of the other schemes so i think from that perspective firstly nonetheless it is support on the table and it's mm -hmm. positive to see support come into the mix right. my personal views have been that we might see popularity to the levels of what we saw for the first home super saver scheme which whilst was another stimulus in favor of first home, home buyers it actually wasn't on the side of high usage or high take up, which is I think what will happen with this one. Yeah, I guess we don't know all the details because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, if okay, if I want to you know, uh, put an Airbnb um, cottage in my garage, mm. you know, will the government say no? All those sorts of things. Uh, do we have any uh, handle on what the devil in the detail might be with this? Well, see, the, the devil in the detail here is that right now, um, it, it does help uh, the group of lower income buyers to have that share of costs of buying a house with an equity partner. And in this case, the equity partner is the government. Mm. And we are seeing, you know, some ranges of equity support from five, even up to say 40%, um, you know, reduction in costs for them because of the equity splits. But I guess the main thing I'm just seeing is there's going to be so many complexities about, you know, removing the capital from the other person or, uh, you know, what the fair value is and what is your value, their value as time goes on. And I guess just your mobility or what you can do with that stock, it might have more complications. So there's definitely much more detail to come through. Yeah. And I feel that with more regulation and more difficulty rather than straight up higher loan to value ratio or support with, you know, the, the first home buyer 10,000 placements that happen with you know, 5% deposits, hmm. um, these sorts of things, that's that's definitely a lot more simpler rather than all the complexities in the current scheme. And I, and I presume this actually hasn't, is not actually in place yet. It's no, no one has taken up shared equity at this point because we don't really know the details. And I guess it has to be supported by parliament. Yeah, there's still a long way to go for this to come through, but the, the momentum from the recent budget was that it's definitely on track or in play for them to push forward to the next steps is the idea we got. Okay, income social housing. What do you want to say about that? Well, see, um, there was a lot of talk about social housing, you know, 10,000 here and another 10,000 there in terms of uh, the big support. Firstly, I think on a conversational aspect, to see the conversation in that direction is great news. Uh, definitely, it means it's the start of more to come. However, when it comes to the actual impact that, you know, 10,000 homes or 20,000 make, it's actually very little. Uh, currently, the wait list is over 100,000 people for public housing support requests. And this 10,000 support, whilst the right direction, whilst the conversation is there, is a, is a drop in the ocean when it comes to the actual uh, impact from the placements needed. Okay, let's go to the next topic, building trends and the housing accord target. Remind people what the housing accord target is. Well, the target was a very, very large ambitious figure in terms of a conversational aspect, mm. which was a million new homes over the next five Sounds years. Sounds like Dr. Evil, a million homes. <laughs> yeah, the pinky fingers right there as well. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it, it sounded large, it obviously gathered applause and pats on the backs, but it, as you said, the, the devil's in the detail, the numbers show that over the last five years, the trends were just over 950,000 uh, completions as per ABS data. So is it really an improvement when you're tracking the last five years and for the next five years? Remember, even with the last five years of completions, we're still in a rental crisis that we are in today. Mm. And that is also including two years worth of little to no population, which still uh, has seen us have that rental crisis. So is it really going to solve or make a dent in the in the right direction? The answer is no, because it's just carrying the last five years trends across for the next five. Yeah. Uh, Arjun, the only thing I saw in that uh, detail or in that, I guess, press release and then budget uh, commentary was at least that they look like they've got some kind of agreement from state and, and local government to actually um, 
help the process of getting more developments in place. That seems like a step in the right direction, but once again, we have to see to what extent uh, those governments are going to be you know, working together. Definitely, step in the right, the right direction is, is the key thing out of this budget. Conversations on social housing, continuous first home buyer support, and thinking of supply issues in Australia. Hmm. That really hasn't happened as a, as a big conversation point up until you know, the recent budget. So I think understanding that this is a conversation that started now, it's in the right direction is key. It's all about how they build from here, but most importantly, they should not be celebrating some of these numbers mentioned because it really is a drop in the ocean of what's needed. Okay, finally, stock mobility amongst established houses. What are you, what are you seeing there? So there was a couple of policies that came out in terms of, you know, increasing the threshold or making it earlier for those who can downsize and contribute funds to their super, mm -hmm. uh, make certain contributions off the back of downsizing in their retirement. These sorts of things are a example of a policy that helps stock mobility amongst established houses. You know, there's over 10 million dwellings in Australia. So any policy around the 10,000 here or 100,000 here, like we saw uh, in some of the mentions is very little. But when you start having policies that influence behavior amongst the rest of the dwellings, call it nine, 9.5 remaining, that is what will drive more availability of housing faster than any sort of new build approach. Yeah. And so that I think is the part that's missing because if we wind the clock back, you know, three to five years, take it to even that five year mark of 2016, 17, we start to see housing supply in a very, very different level in Australia, right? So we look at housing supply and there's actually between 20 and 50% more listings in Australia for sale. Mm. So that clearly shows that the big needle shifters are in the 20 to 40% increase in listings and in the 10 million dwelling pool, not the 1 million new builds or things like that. So we need to look at more you know, policies that are supportive of mobility. So stamp yeah. duty on the cards now, that stamp duty discussion early next year in New South Wales, I think is gonna be a great move and more things that enhance mobility, downsizing, buying, selling, listing. This is what's going to create greater supply for, for access yeah. of health. And I've noticed with our financial planning clients, many of them you know, in that retirement zone, a lot of them are thinking about downsizing because uh, a couple effectively can get $600,000 into their super fund over and above what the cap is as well. And I think from my, my discussion with some of our clients that many of them are happy to get rid of their four bedroom home on a quarter acre block, which a lot of families would love to buy. But what's interesting, I want to see what your reaction to this. Once upon a time, you would have thought the two bedroom uh, apartment is always going to be the sweet spot. But I think over time, particularly with the work from home trend and the older couples who are downsizing, the three bedroom apartment is, is going to become relatively attractive because A, a retiree still might want an office to work from um, uh, or a media room, plus a room for a grandchild or something like that. And on the other hand, people of your age who go into an apartment and want to work from home, they may well want that extra room as a, as a home office. Is that going to be a trend do you think that will actually develop with apartment builders. And I think Harry Triggerboff actually said to me that he's, he's seeing a, a bigger demand for the three bedroom apartment. I agree with this demand shift that's definitely occurred. And we could see that in some of the data in terms of dwelling sales by bedroom type um, amongst this pandemic period as well. Firstly, uh, I think that change definitely needs to be seen in the stock makeup of developer projects to consider some of these changes and trends, yeah. because you're spot on, the three bedrooms have that level of popularity now, when you consider it as a proportion of most developments, it's actually quite a small proportion. Mm. So there's definitely a gap there that you know could be addressed. Uh, as for um, the conflicting point to it, is that the household size from a demographics point of view uh, has been reducing. Mm. So the 2.7 household, average household size is now what, down to 2.5 over recent years. And so that also has shifted more and more people across dwellings, creating you know, more demand for housing. Mm. But I also feel like that might be in some people's minds around the actual room makeups. But I do feel three applies a really good sweet spot in the apartment world for sure. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks for joining us, mate. Thank you.
That's Arjun Palwal, director of investikit.com.au.